For example, in the late 4th century, Epiphanius, Bishop of Salamis, relates this incident in a letter to John, the Bishop of Jerusalem. I came to a villa called Anablatha. Don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Don't know where it is. It's somewhere near Jerusalem. And as I was passing, I saw a lamp burning there. Asking what place it was and learning it to be a church, I went in to pray and found there a curtain hanging on the doors of the said church, dyed and embroidered. It bore an image either of Christ or of one of the saints. I do not rightly remember whose image it was. Seeing this and being loth that an image of a man, loathe, we would say today, uh, I think that's how we pronounce that, uh, loathe, as in hesitant or against, that an image of a man should be hung up in Christ's church contrary to the teaching of the scriptures, I tore it asunder and advised the custodians of the place to use it as a winding sheet for some poor person. He goes on for a bit and he's basically saying that he took it away. So he's explaining he sent a new curtain to John to replace the one that he destroyed. And then he makes this request to John. I beg that you will order the presbyter of the place to take the curtain which I have sent from the hands of the reader and that you will afterward give directions that curtains of the other sort, opposed as they are to our religion, shall not be hung up in any church of Christ. A man of your uprightness should be careful to remove an occasion of offense unworthy alike of the church of Christ and of those Christians who are committed to your charge. So he's saying the, this usage of images in the church is against the teaching of scriptures, it's against our religion. What's interesting is he doesn't seem to think that this needs to be argued for. His relationship with John is strained at this point, but he doesn't seem to be anticipating that there could be resistance to this. It's just kind of, he's just kind of assuming this is what we do. This is what Christians do. This is, the, this is unworthy of the Church of Christ to have those there. Okay. Now, we covered uh, Gavin, a little bit of the video in our previous show. We've done many. Indeed, uh, I don't know if this is going to end up being 10 hours or more, but we've done a lot. So go in, in order. You should find the playlist on my channel. I'll provide it there. Um, the problem we have primarily with this is that Gavin will act as if this is a non-contested text. This is our main problem here. This is what Gavin does. Look at this. Okay. Um now, there's a bunch of other passages from Epiphanius where he has a similar view, but they're sometimes disputed. So rather than get into that, I'm not going to go into No, they're not. No, they're not a bunch of other passages where he has a similar view. There's none other where he has a similar view. No, they're not. And Gavin will then act as if this particular text is not contested. Look at this. Those, I deal with that more in the book. But here's what's important to understand is that even in the fourth directions that curtains of against our religion, what's interesting is he doesn't seem to think that this needs to be argued for. His relationship with John is strained at this point, but he doesn't seem to be anticipating that there could be resistance to this. It's just kind of, he's just kind of assuming this is what we do. This is what Christians do. This is the, this is unworthy of the church of Christ to have those there. Okay. Um, now there's a bunch of other passages from Epiphanius where he has a similar view, but they're sometimes disputed. So this really is problematic. It is problematic that Dr. Ortland will, will tell the audience, you know what, there's other passages that are disputed, but I'm going to deal with one that is not disputed. No, I'm going to tell the audience, this one here is heavily disputed. It was called a fake. It was deemed a fraudulent text by multiple fathers of the church. And it didn't appear, and we... we call them fathers it's late era but either which way we still can call saint john damascene a father um this doesn't appear until the controversy of the iconoclast blows up you would expect it to appear any time before in any of the corpus of authentic writings of saint epiphanius saint epiphanius but gavin ortland doesn't tell you that Gavin Ortland doesn't tell you that he's going to use multiple pseudonymous texts. Gavin Ortland doesn't tell you he's going to use multiple texts that are contested. Gavin Ortland's not going to tell you any of those details. It isn't convenient. He's not going to tell you any of those details because those are not convenient details. But indeed, the problem with the iconophobic texts of St. Epiphanius are we recognize many modern day scholars accept them. Well, we're going to find out later because I have seen people say, well, William, you're admitting that many of them admit they're authentic. You know, modern day scholars are the end all, and you're in a big problem if you're dealing with outdated scholarship. No. 
we're going to find out that even modern day scholarship on this issue is not going to help those that believe that these texts are authentic. This is a problem. Modern day, many accept them as authentic. St. John Damascene, Theodore the Studite, and Nicophorus condemned them as fraudulent. They laid out a great case for I denying the authenticity of the letters. We will examine some of the great points that the fathers made against these so-called Epiphanian texts. I know I had a little typo there. <laughs> Excuse the typos. A lot of work goes into this, so every now and then you might see a typo. Uh, but I promise you, I won't, uh, I won't uh, present any, any information that is pseudonymous and tell you that it's not contested. Promise I won't do that. But let us thus far summarize our evidence on iconoclastic evidence versus evidence in favor of the veneration of icons. Number one, the texts against the usage of images in worship are either heavily contested, they don't appear in any writings of that particular father for many centuries after their death, they have a different writing style, were heavily contested in ICA2, or were never even utilized. We're not going to use any contested or spurious text. And if they are contested, we'll note that. We'll very clearly note that. Like we note that with uh, Eusebius, even though we don't mind utilizing the text uh, either which way. The text of St. Epiphanius only appeared several hundred years after his death. Note, texts appearing at a later date do not automatically disqualify their authenticity, i.e. Theotechnos, Origen, St. Augustine. We realize a text appearing or texts appearing at a later date do not automatically disqualify their authenticity. That is not our argument. What would disqualify their authenticity is if the style of writing and or theology would clearly be at odds with the writing and theology in the non-contested corpus of St. Epiphanius. For instance, it is quite suspect that no one was aware of this particular heresy and or writings in St. Epiphanius until the controversy over images erupted. Now, I know the argument will be said, well, you know what, it's not until after the Panarian that he said, uh, brings up an issue with images and icons. And we'll deal with that later. We will deal with that later because it really does seem to be straining credulity that it was, oh, it's after the Panarian that he has an issue with idolatry. Really? Because he knows about idolatry, particularly the worship of the Coloridians that was out of line and out of orthodoxy. And yet he's not going to know about this or mention this in the Panarian? He didn't know about it before? Even though there's evidence that such actions, such utilization of images in churches existed before? Much like St. Jerome was aware of the seven authentic letters in the Ignatian corpus, thus verifying that we have the correct collection of texts from the Antiochian bishop. These extra texts are highly suspect, and they are. They are first quoted by the iconoclasts, and the great fathers denied their authenticity. That tells you right away there's a problem here. If they're not quoted before, if nobody knows about them before, if they only pop up and they're utilized by the iconoclasts and the fathers, it right away, throw their hands up and say, what is going on? That should raise red flags, even if modern day scholarship wants to say they have to be from Epiphanius or Epiphanius. Modern day scholarship has got to fill in the gaps. And we're going to find out that even the modern day scholarship that believes that these are authentic texts, they don't do any favor to the Protestant position. We're going to find that out because Dr. Ortland will tell you, maybe he'll say that, well, there's other contested texts. I'm not going to use those. Well, he's not giving you the full picture. He's utilizing a contested text. And even if he says, well, you know, I'm aware of the best scholarship. Well, even if you are aware of the best scholarship on this particular issue, even if you are aware of it, the best scholarship doesn't do your position any favors at all. And we'll find out why later. We're going to find out why. This is why we have to do such a massive and voluminous series. This is why, because we have to cover everything in depth. Everything. So that those that may be wondering and say, well, you know what? Uh, I feel like this wasn't covered uh, enough or that wasn't covered enough. We've got it all covered. We've got it covered for you. And we, we want you to be, to be able to realize that your faith 
should not be shaken, but rather should be strengthened after this deep dive. Should be strengthened is what we want you to know. That truly is what we des desire as we dig in deeper. It is the great St. John of Damascus who first mentions these iconophobic texts from St. Epiphanius. He immediately notes that they are fakes. They're fake. He immediately notes that. Second Nicaea and the Iconodules note no such kind of heresy that St. Epiphanius is supposedly condemning in these contested works is ever listed in the Panarian. It doesn't fit. It doesn't make sense. These texts are never heard of prior to the explosion of iconoclasm. Nicophorus notes clear contradictions in the contested texts and those of the actual corpus of St. Epiphanius. From here forward, we will refer to these texts as pseudo-Epiphanius. Because even if we come down and say, well, a lot of scholars believe they're real, a lot don't. They're contested. Pseudo-Epiphanius seems to have an issue with proskuneo and various types of veneration being given to saints. This does not only seem, but it does fly in the face of the language of St. Epiphanius as he condemns the Coloridians, where he notes that there is a proper way to venerate and honor the saints, but offering the, the Eucharist, which amounts to Latria, to St. Mary, would it be idolatry? Pseudo-Epiphanius seems to be a completely different person. This is a red flag. It has got to be emphasized. The real St. Epiphanius was furious that the Coloridians were offering La Trio, La Trevo, Latria, worship to St. Mary. And he's very clear. Let's us look. Yes, of course Mary's body was holy, but she was not God. But the thing with Epiphanius, St. Epiphanius, he indeed was able to say that the saints were worthy of honor. He knew that the difference between Latria and Dulia. He knew you could give honor and veneration to the saints, all the while giving worship to God and God alone. He very well knew that distinction. It even goes as far as to say, yes, the virgin was a virgin and honored as such. But she was not given us to worship. She worships him, though born of her flesh, has come from heaven, from the bosom of his father. Multiple things that Pseudo-Epiphanius was not able to make um, very clear. But notice how when we go forward, like the bodies of the saints, however, she has been held in honor for her character and understanding. And if I should say anything more in her praise, She's like Elijah, who was virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so, and was taken up, has not seen death. She is like John, who leaned on the Lord's breast, the disciple whom Jesus loved. She is like St. Tecla, and Mary is still honored more than she. She's honored more. So the real St. Epiphanius was able to make these very key distinctions that pseudo-Epiphanius was not able to make. Uh, it really does seem to fly in the face of the language of the real Epiphanius, where he condemns the Coloridians, where he notes that there is a proper way to venerate and honor the saints. There are Christological problems with a man who previously was able to make key distinctions in his writings. For instance, Pseudo-Epiphanius has no issue affirming that Christ is in the very same nature as the Father, but seems incredibly confused and hesitant to affirm whether or not Christ is of the same nature as Mary. The texts of Pseudo-Epiphanius border on Manichaeism. There are numerous contradictions, numerous, and I have seen the supposed attempts to try to reconcile these. They're not good. They're not. Even the modern-day scholars that believe, some of them, that Epiphanius was indeed the author, are unable to plug in all these holes. It just... They come to the conclusion the writing style is similar, that it must have come from somebody uh, that was a bishop, uh, and, and numerous other things, but they're unable to plug in every discrepancy. 
And there are a lot of discrepancies. For instance, we have competing origins of uh, St. Epiphanius. One text telling us he was born into a Jewish family, whereas the other says he was born into a family of Catholics that were faithful to the orthodoxy of Nicaea. Well, which one is it? Did uh, St. Epiphanius just forget? Did he just forget? I mean, he would have had to have forgotten a lot of things, right? Proper Christology about this heresy that he never brought up in his Panarian, and even his own origin story. We, we run into all of these problems, and it is as if this text is not contested. Um, now, there's a bunch of other passages from Epiphanius where he has a similar view, but they're sometimes disputed. So rather than get into that, I'm not going to go into those. I deal with that more in the book. I will be very interested in seeing uh, Dr. Ortland's book in this topic. I'd be very interested in seeing the scholarship that he puts forth in this book. I'll be one of the first ones in line to get a copy of this book. But I would add that I am I'm a little bit stunned that he at least doesn't tell the audience, well, look, you know what? There's a lot of modern day scholars. They do believe this text is from Epiphanius. But you know what? Um, I'm going to use it anyway, even though it is, it is very contested. I'm going to utilize it. Just tell the audience that. Let them know that you're going to utilize a contested text, that you know that it is contested, but that you're going to point out that, you know what, well, I'm going to fall in line with these modern-day scholars, and then tell them how many modern-day scholars don't even agree with your conclusion as to what the text is saying. That would be better, in my opinion. But I don't think that, doc, that would fit Dr. Gavin Ortland's um, message he's trying to put forth in this video. I'm very careful. I'm very careful to not say agenda. I don't want to paint him as a as a you know a guy that's just really uh, hell bent on lying and spreading misinformation. But what I do think Gavin is um, dedicated to is to stop the bleeding and to do it in, in any way he can, even if it is. Um, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, but even if it is using texts that he knows are very heavily contested, uh, he, the bleeding being that even friends of his are hopping ship or leaving Protestantism, that nothing he can do, shows, debates, anything, um, can prevent that. People are, are realizing the massive issues within Protestantism, the, the very fact that it's a sinking ship, it's an absolute mess within Protestantism, and they're leaving for apostolic Christianity. They're leaving. You can't like this. He can't be too happy with it. They are leaving for apostolic Christianity. So he is doing his best to try to look at things like the uh, bodily assumption of Mary, purgatory, many other things. By the way, if you want to look at the, the complete and utter refutations of those to where Gavin just gave up. He didn't even bother replying anymore. After we trotted out the scholars, now he was misrepresenting them. Uh, there was nothing else for, for him to do. Nothing else. Go look at those videos we've done. Augustine, purgatory, uh, bodily assumption of Mary. The, the desperation is not going to end because Dr. Ortland does not want his fellow Protestants to be leaving, and they're leaving by the boatload. They are leaving. We'll get to Eusebius of Caesarea in our next show, but right now, more Epiphanius. We remind people that we find a very interesting quote in Yaroslav Pelican. And from the work that it does come from, let's check it out briefly. In particularly his book, um, The Emergence of the Catholic Tradition, The Spirit of Eastern Christendom. We find, uh, this is actually uh, volume two, The Spirit of Eastern Christendom, uh, The Christian Tradition, A History of the Development of, Do of Doctrine. It's exactly what we're quoting from. We don't want to get accused of not quoting it properly. And he does say, Epiphanius, that famous standard bearer of orthodoxy, that the iconoclasts were able to make good use of these writings to support their case from, from patristic tradition. So he's talking about the disputed Epiphanian texts, those that were clearly against icons and images. This is what he's talking about. Uh, this is the text he is speaking of. So this is what we need to uh, deal with. And this is exactly what he's talking about. So citing the use of, of Epiphanius, John of Damascus suggested that these writings might not be genuine, but even if they were, they did not. And, and excuse me, I'm copying and pasting it from the ebook, so there's a bunch of uh, typos. I don't know why the ebook does that. I uh, wish I had it in Kindle. Kindle was much better. Uh, but a lot of these books that I do own that I've converted, 
um, the converting process doesn't always go, <laughs> go great. Um, they did not of themselves constitute normative tradition, which was on the side of the images. Nicophorus too sought to show that Epiphanius was not the true author of the works attributed to him by the iconoclasts. He also composed a work against Epiphanius, refuting and incidentally preserving fragments from these early treatises against images. Even in modern times, the authenticity of these treatises has been questioned. Even in modern times, the authenticity has been questioned, but they are now regarded as probably genuine. But we're going to see what does that mean? There are some modern scholars that do view them as probably genuine, but what does that mean? Now, Otto Bartenhuer and Danielle Ceruz are two prominent scholars that believe that the texts attributed to St. Epiphanius are definitely pseudo-Epiphanius. So we've got a number of scholars, many that do not believe that they are legitimate, but I know what the claim is going to be, and I've heard it over and over. Well, what about the modern-day scholars? We want scholars, you know, that wrote recently, that have done deeper dives, that have dug in, and that have actually, you know, there has been some, you know, the 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 ticker has moved on this, you know, uh, and, and the hand of the clock has moved on this. So more modern, better studies that have been done. Come on, William. Well, there are some modern day scholars that believe that some of the letters discovered are authentic, but we can find even major ones believing that the documents with iconoclastic theology are eighth century forgeries. This position can be found in Dr. Oscar Gorski. And the Reverend Dr. Mayendor believes that the documents are forgeries. He finds issue with the fragmentary nature and incredibly late dating of the text. He believes they are definitely questionable. Now, you may be wondering, William, why don't you quote Mayendor? Why don't you quote the mom? Uh, you know, the show would go three, four hours long. I don't have time to quote them all. Uh, it would be impossible. Uh, it, what I'm going to quote is I am going to do even better for those that are against this position. Now, I've quoted a number of scholars already. I've, I've, I've shown you the fathers that contest them. But I'm going to show you that, yeah, there are show, some modern-day scholars that believe they, that these are from St. Epiphanius. Uh, they are genuine. But what about the major scholars that believe they are genuine? Do they do any positive case? Do they prove anything for the uh, iconophobes? Uh, I don't want to, I'm not referring to modern day people. I'm not calling them iconophobes. I'm calling, I'm referring to them, those in second I see it, but today we can refer to them as those being against images in worship. Uh, we're going to look at the quotes. Now, Dr. Kitzinger believes all the documents are from St. Epiphanius, but he says it is possible they are not originals. So he leaves the room open, he leaves the room open, uh, he leaves the door quite, uh, quite ajar there for later over scholarship to overturn his, his opinion. Not exactly a resoundingly positive position on the authorship being Epiphanian. Dr. Tandene, without taking an actual position, notes that the texts against images are contested. He notes that there are many issues with the contested texts. And I think this is a very important part we're going to look at. The Latin text, we are told by scholar Charles Murray, the Latin text, which is not original, says Charles Murray, uh, and actually many other scholars, and that's what the text says, says the figure was an image of Christ or a saint. But the Greek clearly shows it was not. Let us examine what scholar Charles Murray has to say about the epiphany and iconophobe works, because <laughs> this is what they're not telling you. In the scholarly journal, Art in the Early Church, by the way, it's great having access to scholarly journals. In this scholarly journal, we read uh, Charles Murray has such an incredible take on this. This is really, honestly, I have to say, this is essential reading. Go read the whole thing. Now, am I going to read the whole thing? I'm going to skim through it. But I'm going to show you that even if we take the position that these are actually pro from St. Epiphanius, it does no favor to the, icona, uh, the iconoclast position. Now, we're going to hear, well, you know, the majority of scholarship believes them to be authentic. Okay, well, but do these majority of scholars, do all of them take your position? Or do some of these major scholars that have looked at the Greek and Latin actually say, well, they're authentic, 
but they're not against icons the way that the iconic class would have hoped they would have been. And the iconic class were relying upon a forged part of the text that's not part of the Greek original. You don't hear that, though, do you? If the ultimate problem of the letter of Eusebius is one of authenticity, <laughs> we haven't even gotten to Eusebius yet, the case of the passages from Epiphanius is quite different. It is a time, this time, one of interpretation. So uh, she's very clear that the letter of Eusebius, it's not authentic. We know it's not. It's very doubtful. And even if it is, we'll see in the next episode how that doesn't really, it doesn't do the, uh, the, the iconoclast position any help. This one is one of interpretation. The authenticity of the fragments attributed to Epiphanius by the iconoclasts in the seven in 754 and 815 has been controverted since the time of the iconoclastic controversy itself, and it has been discussed exhaustively from this point of view in more recent times by Hall and Ostrogorsky. Ostrogorsky denied the authenticity of all but the testament of, of Epiphanius, and Hall accepted the attribution of them all. The argument on both sides turn in the last analysis on the Christology contained in the fragments and the hall the witness of Epiphanius was essential as proof of a dogmatic connotation of the whole problem of Im 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 images which he believed to be present as early as the 4th century. This was the reason why he discussed the authenticity of all. This is going to get really good. Really get your popcorn. Get your popcorn. This is going to be good. This is good. Oscar Gorski's work was severely reviewed after its publication, and he capitulated on the authenticity of the letter of John of Jerusalem. The question with regard to the fragments still remains obscure, but one fact which is of the highest importance for the purpose of this paper has emerged from the controversy, and it concerns the text of this letter to John of Jerusalem. It is now known that the Greek original of the famous curtain episode preserved in the Latin translation of St. Jerome and believed to be lost does in fact survive. As will appear, this is crucial with regard to the use of this letter as evidence of Epiphanius taking up of the matter of Christian religious images as an issue and the fact that even the most skeptic do not doubt that Epiphanius was an opponent of Christian religious imagery. For it is the letter which is the real basis of this view. It is the tearing down of the curtain with its figured representation from the church door of a village in Palestine that is regarded as the locus classicus for Epiphanius iconophobia. For this reason, the less important fragments are left aside in discussions of his supposed hostility to art. Particularly as there is always a possibility that they are spurious, the curtain passage seems to be undoubtedly authentic. Okay. It's authentic because of the contemporary witness of St. Jerome. However, so far as I know, the Greek and Latin texts have never been compared in order to see what Epiphanius actually wrote. And if therefore the usual interpretation is correct, the scholarly tradition with which this paper is concerned has always based its interpretation only on the Latin of St. Jerome and this appears to be the basic mistake, which has led to misinterpretation. Cook was writing before Ostrogorsky's work, although Cyrus had isolated the Greek text before his publication. Eliger published his monograph much later, but ignored Cyrus and Ostrogorsky and relied entirely on Hall. Klauser, too, makes reference only to the Latin text, and Schnemelcher, who wrote the article in Epiphanius in the Realexicon, also relied on Jerome for his statement of the traditional view of Epiphanius and imagery. Dr. Kelly relied on Schneemelcher, and this may be how he was led into an error of fact in his recent discussion of the passage. Before comparing the two texts, some remarks are perhaps in order. It is not usually made clear when Jerome's text is used that there is a question of his having if not falsified, at least tampered with a letter of Epiphanius, which he was translating. The question was so pointed that it drew from Jerome a reply in the form of a letter on the principles of good translation. It should be further noted that the substance of the accusation was that he had failed to reproduce the courteous and quiet tone of the original. We move on. It is important to read all this. Don't worry, a few more pages. In addition... It is important to emphasize from the archaeological point of view that the curtain episode has the contents. 
It is in essence an apology for not sending sooner a curtain to replace the one he had pulled down. For it should be observed that the immediate criticism made of Epiphanius' action by the people involved was not a protest that he had destroyed an image of Christ, but that he had removed a valuable curtain and not replaced it. Epiphanius excused the delay because he wanted to find a really good one. So felt it better to send to Cyprus for one of the right quality as well uh, as of religious acceptability. It is the detaching of the episode from its context and the loss of the overall courteous presentation and excusing of his action that has caused attention to be focused on a rabid tearing down of curtains and, according to the Latin, a sharp reminder about the second commandment resulting in the standard picture of Epiphanius as a raving iconoclast. Another matter of context, this time of social context, should also be considered here. For content seems to disappear altogether when Epiphanius and art are discussed. Really, I agree. It is well to be reminded of the background against which Epiphanius moved, so as to have a perspective from which to approach the literary evidence. The works of St. Jerome are a mind of information about Epiphanius and enable us to see him in his own time. As a visitor to Rome, he is a welcome friend of Dam Damasus, the Pope, famous in his own day. And since for the care of money he lavished on the material monuments of the church, in particular the catacombs, Sunday walks to the catacombs with their painted decorations so conducive to meditation were a favorite form of recreation with Jerome and his friends. Wow. Works of art were essential to the piety of aspirants to the priesthood in official church circles in the 4th century. Although this seems to have escaped the attention of the hostility theorists, Epiphanius is known to have received hospitality from and given it to the cultured and wealthy Leda Paula. And, and he also preached in the Anastasis at Jerusalem on the Feast of the Dedication. Yet in all this, there is no surviving record that he felt himself threatened by revolutionary images put up by the laity in the teeth of the bishops and the clergy. So, uh, rightly so, uh, the scholar notes, uh, hey, you know what? <laughs> we don't even need to, you know what? If you want to claim that after the Panarian, uh, he became a raging iconophobe, well, we're going to show that the text itself doesn't bear that out. Uh, doesn't, even if you want to say that, uh, you know, this comes after the Panarian, uh, it doesn't bear it out. Does the literary evidence then confirm the traditional view of Epiphanius' attitude to art or not? In his letter 51 of Jerome, we read that on entering the village of Anablatha and seeing a lamp burning and learning that there was a church in the place, he went in to pray and let us go to the text. That's the Latin. Then we've got the Greek. But, you know, we should be able to, uh, for you, for the audience, uh, I don't think uh, the text is here. You know what? Let us look at the Latin. Let us look at the Greek. I will get English for you all. Give me one moment. I want you all to have a great experience. The English of the Greek. We saw there a lamp burning. We inquired about this and learned that there was a church in that place. We went in to pray and found a colored door, curtain hanging in front of the door. On the door curtain, there was something idolatrous in the form of a man. The parishioner said it was perhaps a representation of Christ or of one of the saints. I don't remember. Knowing that such things are detestable in the church, I tore the door, door curtain down and suggested it be used as a burial cloth for a poor person. Now, notice that his complaint here is that it was something idolatrous in the form of a man. It wasn't Christ or one of the saints. It was an idol in the form of a man. The English of the Latin, though, says, I came to a town called Anablotha, and as I was passing, saw a lamp burning there, asking what place it was, and learning it to be a church, I went in to pray, and found there a curtain hanging in the door of the said church, dyed and embroidered. It bore an image either of Christ or of one of the saints. Now, do you notice how different the text is? I do not rightly remember whose the image was. Seeing this and being loath that an image of a man should be hung up in Christ church, contrary to the teaching of the scriptures, I tore it asunder and advised the custodians of the place to use it as a winding sheet for some poor 
person. It is only in the Latin, which is not the original, that we see that the image was idolatrous and having the form of a man, as the scholar Charles Murray rightly points out. But as Charles Murray goes forward, the fact which emerges plainly here is that what the Latin speaks of an image as of Christ or some saint, identifying, although not very clearly, apparently a Christian image, the Greek makes quite clear what it was. It was an idol in the shape of a man. Now let's go back up to the Greek, and you can clearly see exactly what we're being told here. It's an idol in the shape of a man. You can see it right here. Let's look at it all. You can see it's talking about an idol in the shape of it. I can't highlight it. Uh, it doesn't let me highlight it particularly. It's an idol in the shape of a man. So it's very important here. The Greek, the Greek makes it quite clear. An idol. Furthermore, it was only alleged to represent Christ or one of the saints by the bystanders, not by Epiphanius. This, too, is missing in the Latin. In other words, what seems to have been on the curtain was not a Christian figure at all and was recognized as such by Epiphanius. It would be quite consistent with known Christian practice for the community, a Christian community of this church, to have bought what they regarded as a beautiful curtain for their church, regardless of the design. This is the important point we have to realize that the scholars are saying. This is the important point. So we go forward. And as we go forward, we read examples of the extraordinarily pagan things which Christians made use of are the projector casket from the Esquiline treasure and now in the British Museum, museum or the Trepane treasure of Edinburgh. These all fall into the class of luxury objects and from what is known as a manufacture, geographical distribution, an expense of high-quality textiles in the Roman world. This curtain of Anablatha should perhaps be put in the same class. It would therefore scarcely be surprising that the authorities took a dim view of Epiphanius' removal of and slowness in replacing such an object. If, on the other hand, the representation was Christian and is usually thought, then it seems to imply a single figure frontally typed, of the type found in pagan cultic representations, but of which there is no evidence in 4th, 5th century Christian art. The implication, therefore, seems to be again, as in Eusebius' letter, that it was an icon. Epiphanius does not appear to mind what it represents. It was the possibility of its interpretation as a cult figure to which he objected. The second point made clear in the comparison of the two texts, is that only the Latin speaks of the authority of Scripture forbidding human representation. Clearly, clearly this is forged. Now, what is my opinion? I don't think it's even authentic. That's my opinion. I'm of the opinion of other scholars and of the church fathers that don't think it's real. But if you want to take Charles Murray and you want to say, well, you know, there are modern day scholars that believe it is authentic. Okay. But then what do they say about the authenticity? And you run into someone like Charles Murray. Says, while the exact prescription is not specified, Klauser and other scholars are surely right in identifying here the prohibition of the second commandment. But the Greek simply says that mounting of idols is a hateful practice in the church and omits all mention of scripture. The Greek passage, therefore, will not support the traditional view here either that Epiphanius was hostile to the making of images on the grounds of the second commandment. This discussion of the evidence from Epiphanius may be concluded with reference again to the study of Kitzinger. As quoted earlier, he believed Epiphanius was an opponent of Christian, not merely pagan imagery. And when he wished to find confirmation of this from a text about which no questions of authenticity could be raised, he looked to the Panarian. And... It, the Greek, which he quoted, says, when images are put up, the customs of the pagans do the rest. And he comments, this surely ref reflects the experience of his own age. Unfortunately, it does not. Consultation of the original context of the Panarian shows that the sentence comes from a passage 
in which Epiphanius, following Irenaeus, is simply giving information about the Carpocratian Gnostics and saying that when they have put up their images, then pagan customs complete the matter. Not only has Kittensinger misunderstood the reference of the passage, but as can be seen, he's also mistranslated it. And by turning the aorist active participle into a passive, he has made into a generalization about images. What an epiphanius was a specific reference to a specific group of heretics and not a discussion of imagery at all. This is not going so well for the iconoclast, is it? It really isn't going very well, right? So what are you going to take? The church fathers that were orthodox that said the documents were fake? Are you going to take many of the modern day scholars that say they're checkered? They got a checkered history. They're doubtful. Are you going to take the modern day scholars that say they are legitimate, but they clearly do not show what the iconoclasts wish they showed? Any way you turn, St. Epiphanius is not a friend of the Protestant position. I promise you that. Both the mistranslation and the misconception had been adopted by Barnard. Finally, how very slender the case for Pitfinius hostility really is may be judged from one more piece of evidence. Hall and following him, Kitzinger, interpreted the writings and activities of Pitfinius against the background of the passage from Augustine discussed earlier. But as a primary reference is to obsessive eating at funeral meals and perhaps to real idolatry, practiced by a group of deviant Christians in Africa, it cannot well be used as a logical background for a supposed antagonism to Christian art on the part of Epiphanius. In conclusion, therefore, if the foregoing analysis of the literary evidence is correct, it seems a reasonable assessment of the case to say that there is very little indication, indeed, that the fathers of the early church were in any way opposed to art. Wow. Wow. This is Oxford Journal scholarship, modern day scholarship. Since then, according to the traditional view taken of the literature, so many difficulties and inconsistencies have to be explained away. To say nothing of nothing of explaining away the art itself, it seems far simpler and more in accord with what the fathers actually wrote to conclude that there was never a dichotomy between the art and the literature of the early church, and apparently in salt and and an apparently insoluble problem proves never to have been a problem at all. It does seem impossible to believe, nor does there now seem to be any, any evidence for doing so, that all the wealth of art which survives was produced in the face of church authorities. <laughs> Goodness, think of that. Some of the Dura paintings are, if one considers it, remarkably sketchy, and although Christ is represented there, there's no question of portraiture. Nor could the innumerable figures in the sarco sarcophagi and in the catacombs be considered in any way objects of worship. There's no question of idolatry arising in connection with the art as we have it. Yet idolatry was what the iconic class feared and what the modern interpretation makes the basis of the hostility to Christian art in the authorities of worship, in the authorities of the church. It would be unhistorical to consider that these works provided such a possibility. Although it's also, it is extremely puzzling, if the standard hypothesis is correct, that all this art should suddenly spring up at the end of the second century, despite the Pope in the official burying ground of the Roman church, for that the catacombs were official, we know beyond doubt from Hippolytus. At the risk of possible overstatement, the point of view opposite to that normally adopted in discussions of Christian art needs stating. And it is therefore necessary to emphasize the universal character of this art as it is found in the catacombs and sarcophagi from all over the Roman Empire and its completely non-idolatrous character. We want to close the show out with the exact way we opened it. By examining Dr. Ortland's words to remind the audience, I want to remind you I want you to remember that this is what we were told by Dr. Orton. Need to be addressed here and there. Here and there, people will cross the line and the use of images will cross over into a cultic use of images. And when that happens, you find these crackdowns from various church leaders. Well, the, the uh, implication is that the church leader we're about to hear about, St. Epiphanius, 
uh, order to crack down here. And let's hear one more time to really show that we want our Protestant friends to do better. Was all of the information shown by Dr. Ortland? Uh, my argument would be that the information was portrayed in a misleading manner. For example, in the late fourth century, Epiphanius, Bishop of Salamis, relates this incident in a letter to John, the Bishop of Jerusalem. I came to a villa called Anna. Now, why doesn't Dr. Ortland tell you that this is the English translation of the Latin that scholars do not believe to be the original Greek? Why are we not told that? Now, Dr. Ortland may very well come back and say, well, William, it's in my book. I know that. But why not tell the audience at least? Especially if you're saying you're going to deal with texts that are, you know what, you're, you know that there's contested texts, but you're not going to deal with those. You're going to deal with what you know is modern day scholarship believes to be authentic. Why don't you deal with what modern day scholarship believes to be authentic? Or at least say that there is a certain opinion circulating. Blatha. Don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Don't know where it is. It's somewhere near Jerusalem. And as I was passing, I saw a lamp burning there. Asking what place it was and learning it to be a church, I went in to pray and found there a curtain hanging on the doors of the said church, dyed and embroidered. It bore an image either of Christ or of one of the saints. I do not rightly remember whose image it was. Seeing this and being loth that an image of a man, loathe we would say today, uh, I think that's how we pronounce that, uh, loathe, as in hesitant or against that an image of a man should be hung up in Christ's church contrary to the teaching of the scriptures, I tore it asunder and advised the custodians of the place to use it as a winding sheet for some poor person. He goes on for a bit and he's basically saying that he took it away. So he's explaining he sent a new curtain to John to replace the one that he destroyed. And then he makes this request to John. I beg that you will order the presbyter of the place to take the curtain which I have sent from the hands of the reader and that you will afterward give directions that curtains of the other sort opposed as they are to our religion, shall not be hung up in any church of Christ. A man of your uprightness should be careful to remove an occasion of offense, unworthy alike of the church of Christ and of those Christians who are committed to your charge. So he's saying the, this usage of images in the church is against the teaching of scriptures, it's against our religion. What's interesting is he doesn't seem to think that this needs to be argued for. His relationship with John is strained at this point, but he doesn't seem to be anticipating that there could be resistance to this. It's just kind of, he's just kind of a assuming this is what we do. This is what Christians do. This is the, this is unworthy of the church of Christ to have those there. Okay. Um, now there's a bunch of other passages from Epiphanius where he has a similar view, but they're sometimes disputed. So rather than get into that, I'm not going to go into that. That is what disappointed me more than anything else. <laughs> you deal with the disputed ones and you deal with the text that modern day scholars don't think is even authentic. The, the Latin, uh, the English translation of the Latin without even telling the audience. Um, that there is some uh, dispute there. Oh, goodness. Got to love that. You really got to love that. Uh, for the audience wondering, uh, no, I don't think Dr. Orland will ever debate me. In fact, I'm, I flat out tell you, he's never going to debate me. And I'm going to debate this topic. I will debate this topic with an individual that I think is a fantastic interlocutor on this topic and has actually done research. And it actually would, has been able to make the distinction on Epiphanius and Unusabius and an Olvira that knows these arguments very well that would not have presented it in this way. Keep an eye out for that. We're going to get a ro robust debate going um, and it's going to be incredible. God bless you. So this is where we are at. After our exhaustive examination of St. Epiphanius, we realize the Latin text, which is not original, says the figure was an image of Christ or a saint, but the Greek clearly shows it was not. Now, what is the conclusion that we arrive at? This is what you were not told before. Many scholars that believe that the Epiphanian texts are authentic still do not believe that they are iconophobic. For instance, one major scholar, Charles Murray, points to, uh, that, that is pointed to for believing in the authenticity of the text, rather argues that St. Epiphanius is not an iconophobe. We just saw the whole, basically the whole um, theological scholarly journal. This scholar believes as many do, 
that the Latin translation of the text does not accurately reflect the original Greek text that was discovered. In her meticulous research, she studies the Greek of the text and notes that it indeed does speak of a harsh attitude, but towards idols. She says, she says it is an idol in human form that is portrayed on the curtain that St. Epiphanius references. The church goers seemingly believed it to be a pious image, but the original Greek text does not bear out this poor misinterpretation. The Latin text, which is not original, says the figure was an image of Christ or a saint, but the Greek clearly shows it was not. What was being condemned in the Greek was an idol. Our conclusion is a very clear one. Now, if you ask me, what, William, what do you think? Do you think any of them are, are legitimate? My personal belief, so I side with the fathers that believe they were forgeries. But even if we take the position that they were authentic, some of the greatest modern day scholars that believe it to be authentic do not believe them to be against icons in the proper usage, but against idols. This is a huge blow to the Protestant position. Have you been edified? Have you learned anything new? Consider supporting us on Patreon. You can see the link right down there below. That is how we are able to do all of this work. This is how we are able to purchase expensive books, write books, purchase art for the books, and to be able to produce videos like this where we have got to buy many scholarly journals or books ahead of time to do this kind of research. Please consider supporting us on Patreon. It would go a very long way. And if you can't or are unable to, please do me a huge favor. Hit like, share, subscribe, and algorithm time. Comment down below, please. Let me know if you're ratified. God bless you. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.